So today I'll be talking about monitoring for training data maintenance, really looking at uh, manual annotation. Um, like Priel mentioned, my name is Will Huang, and just a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a data scientist at Capital One uh, on the EP2 ML or Enterprise Product and Platforms team, uh, where I'm focusing on the natural language understanding and natural language processing or NLU, NLP um, capabilities of our virtual assistant, you know, or a chatbot. Uh, prior to joining Capital One, I did my master's at NYU studying scientific computing. I was a risk management analyst for a few years at AIG, and I got my bachelor's um, in operations research at Cornell. And if you're interested in chatting about anything that I talk about here, um, NLP in general, or Eno at Capital One, feel free to reach out to me at william.huang at capitalone.com. And with that, uh, I'll dive into the presentation. So first, I'll do a little bit of a setup, uh, setting up the context of where this work is sitting, um, and then discuss a little bit about this idea of data set cartography. This is a diagnos diagnostic method that came out of the Allen Institute for AI, or AI2, uh, by Swayam Dita et al. And then now that there's this diagnostic method, what this kind of means for industry systems and how can we Cool, so the problem set up, um, I work on our chatbot. And so a lot of what's on my mind day to day is this NLU pipeline for a conversational AI system. Um, and so one such pipeline might look a little like this where you have a customer sentence or an utterance that comes in and you might want to do intent classification or really try to understand what the customer is trying to express with this natural language text. Uh, you want to do some information extraction like name density matching or NER um, and you might want to do some slot filling so once you actually know the type of uh, you know, request there is, how do you actually fulfill that? And so an example here is this utterance, what's the statement balance on my credit card? Um, our intent classification system might label it as a retrieve balance intent. Uh, our NER system might extract that statement balance here as an entity of type balance type and credit card as an entity of type account. And then now that we know we want to retrieve the balance, um, filling in some more information that's necessary to actually do this. So knowing that the type of information we want to retrieve is a statement balance and then actually filling in the associated ID number uh, for this customer's credit card. And so for today, I'll mainly be focusing around this intent classification problem that we're thinking about NLP uh, in a classification task. And so now that we have the context set, uh, data diagnostic is uh, really, I think, an important thing to think about when we're talking about data-centric AI. Uh, we all want to improve the quality of our data sets, but how do we actually measure something like that? Um, what I think is really desirable here is maybe a high quality or at least, uh, you know, very interpretable uh, tool to understand what's a good data set and that's easily comparable among different data sets. And what we looked towards was this thing called data set cartography. So this is a paper that came out of AI2 um, in the NLP space. And what this is trying to do is taking what they call training dynamics. Um, so model behaviors over the course of training and use these metrics to plot each example into a data map. So something that looks like this figure down here. I'll go into more of the technical details of what is going on here, but in a sense, we have these things called prediction confidence, variability, and correctness. And with each of these metrics, we're able to take all the examples in our training data and plot them into three main regions, hard to learn, easy to learn, and ambiguous. If you're using an iterative training scheme, like those that are commonly used for deep learning, uh, you only need little overhead since you might be using uh, intermittent uh, validation evaluation, so every so update steps or epochs to get a sense of how your model is training, maybe doing early stopping, 
And then if you're doing this evaluation already, the overhead you need is uh, to calculate these metrics and then maybe some visualization code, which is actually open source from AI2 to generate plots like this. And so now just illustrating what's going on. So in an iterative training scheme, if we have a classification model uh, like the one here, the prediction, if we're talking about a classification problem, might look like, and this prob probability distribution will evolve over the course of training every epoch, so you might look at it. And the amount of probability mass, let's say, placed on the gold label um, will, will change so often. And so taking that information, we can calculate these metrics called confidence, variability, and correctness which are the average prediction probability over the number of epochs or over the number of times that you're actually looking at this probability distribution of the gold label. Variability is the standard deviation of that probability. And correctness is the percentage of time that the model has shown the correct behavior or the old behavior. And so with these, we can generate a figure like this so our data map, and this is uh, what we see from our internal data. And some things to point out here, um, if you look at this bottom histogram on the far right, a histogram of correctness, you can see that we are uh, we're evaluating on the data that we're training. So this is more just kind of diagnosing what we're using for training. And so you would expect to do pretty well uh, on, on your training data. Um, and so if we were to look just at uh, a measure like accuracy or this performance measure here, we would miss uh, a lot more information that we can get from this data map. And um, specifically is this general hard to learn region on the bottom. And so how one might read a data map like this is if you take a point at the bottom left corner, uh, these are points that have low confidence and low variability. And so what that means is that an example here has very low probability mass placed on the uh, gold label. Um, and this hasn't really changed through training. There's no uh, learning really going on of the correct behavior. This is kind of always wrong throughout the entire training. And then on the other hand, if you look at the top left corner in this blue easy to learn region, we have examples with, with high confidence, low variability. So these are the types of examples that have been picked up very early on in the training. The model's confident of the correct behavior, and this hasn't really fluctuated throughout uh, the training. And so with this, we get a nice visual diagnostic um, that we can use with little overhead if you're using an iterative training scheme. Um, and you can compare different data sets, different subsets of data sets um, uh, pretty easily but it's not really actionable. So that's kind of the next step from taking this from this method to maybe using it in a production setting. And so what does this mean for industry systems? Well, the first thing that we tried to do um, was take these metrics and see if we can use this in an automatic way. Um, here, what we've done is filtered out the least confident examples based off of our data set map. Um, and with that, one thing to know is that as you remove data, you're going to remove the uh, amount of uh, classes that are represented in your training data. And so in this figure, we have two, uh, two graphs. So one in orange, which indicates the performance on a held out set of uh, classes that are represented in the training set. And the blue is just the all, uh, performance on the entire held out set. Um, and what we saw was a slight performance. Uh, it's rel pretty marginal, but it's also difficult to say since the you know, performance is pretty saturated here at 96%. Um, and, but we see a, a slight bump just removing 5% of these confident examples. Um, there's some signal that we could use this in, in some type of fashion here, but um, I think there's still more work to be done. And what we did next was really kind of pull back to the, I think, uh, spirit of, of the data set cartography. So looking more at a qualitative uh, inspection of different regions uh, to, to see if we can use this data map as a signal for, for maybe signaling uh, different cleanups. 
And so uh, what I have here is on the right, a data map. Uh, so this is the same thing that I showed before. And on the left is kind of an example, very uh, illustrative example. This is purely didactic um, of what in the, might be going on in the embedding space. And we actually found two uh, different cases. The first case here is an isolated mislabeling. So really in the bottom, far bottom left of this hard to learn region, um, we see examples where in the embedding space, uh, the hard to learn example is in red and this has been mislabeled and the nearest uh, examples in the semantic space are actually correctly labeled. So the models learn the correct behavior because there are correctly labeled examples um, and we do have mislabelings and this might be something we want to revisit and correct. Another thing we found as we moved up this hard to learn region is what uh, I've been calling systematic mislabeling. Um, and so the key thing in the embedding space to note is that the correctness of the labels have kind of flipped. Um, and I call it systematic because there's actually more mislabeled uh, examples than are correctly labeled. And this might happen for different reasons, but uh, I think the main takeaway here is that uh, the hard to learn region doesn't necessarily always mean an error, but we could potentially use these kind of as anchor points and look around in the semantic, uh, the context of the training data and to see if there's maybe something else going on. Um, and so these are the kind of two insights that we have so far on how we might use this. And so really building around this is some work that's still in flight, but uh, I'll just talk very broadly that you know, in a industry setting, as you have a system that's live, I think a lot of what we've heard through this conference is that uh, there's this myth that you release a system, it goes into production and uh, you just monitor it. But in reality, you have evolving task definitions and these evolving task definitions require data set collection over changing context, whether it be social context, uh, different product offerings, different platform capabilities. Um, but for manually labeled data, this will naturally lead into conflicting annotator opinions. Um, there's two uh, types of conflicts that I really see or major like glaring conflicts. First, uh, hard conflicts. So these are those syntactically uh, same or similar examples. And those are pretty easy to catch, right? You just use a string match or a regex. Uh, you find when two examples look the same um, and then try to resolve the conflict. But then there are these soft conflicts. So these things that are semantically similar, but they aren't written the same. There's slight differences in the way that people have phrased it. Um, and so I think what we can use from our observations here is some combination of data set cartography and maybe a semantic match. Um, using that hard to learn region really as anchor points. And when we are looking towards uh, resolving maybe, maybe these conflicts, providing the extra context of the semantic nearest neighbor uh, matches. And so that's pretty much all I've uh, prepared for today. Um, and I'd like to open up for any questions the audience might have. Thank you so much, Will. It was uh, an incredible presentation. Uh, I have also personally worked with some conversational AI applications here at Snuffle. Um, and uh, uh, what you mentioned about data and manual annotation is like right on point uh, with respect to conversational AI applications. It's so difficult to uh, keep up with like the changing uh, domains uh, or even like the intents. They, they are so fluid, I would say. Uh, mm -hmm. So you might have 20 intents on day one and then you might have to increase to maybe a hundred intents on day 10. So it's really important to be uh, able to keep up with that. Um, makes sense. Um, I am looking for quick, any questions, um, just a moment. Yeah, first question is, uh, how can modeling evolve and keep up with the data as it changes? How can modeling evolve and keep up with the data as it changes? Um, I think that's, that's a good question. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit, and so not you know exactly related to this, but thinking um, one thing that I think we've kind of been keen on looking at is this idea of contrastive learning. 
um, to to try to enable, um, I guess, the idea of like few shot few shot learning. Um, and so, you know, if you use contrastive learning in the right right way, and 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 that's kind of the hard part. That's the you know the magic uh, behind the curtains. So. I think there are some papers out there um, for conversational AI systems. There's this paper called Confit that uh, we like a lot that um, uses contrastive learning in a supervised way. Um, and what that enables you is to have these embeddings that seem to match up by intent. So it's like very specific for your system. Um, so how does that, uh, you know, work with evolving data. Well, so in what we kind of played with, um, this kind of helps re reduce some of the um, you know, overhead costs. So you're able to do kind of this few shot learning. So taking advantage of this type of training plus the training at scale pre-training um, and your embeddings seem a little bit more robust. So no longer do you have to do like full fine tuning. You can maybe just throw these New, new data examples, new intents, et cetera, into the embedding space. Um, the tricky thing there is uh, what's a good signal for like, okay, we, we need these clusters to be better. But um, I think maybe that's, that's one avenue to potentially explore. Got it, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, our next question is from Alan and they say, from your analysis, finding systemic mislabeled data, where uh, were you ultimately able to develop a programmatic method of removing them from your training data? So I don't think we've gone that far yet uh, to kind of automate it. Um, uh, I think we're we're in in this is kind of also my my personal take. I think um, with all the you know difficulties and noise around manually annotated data, it's still very, very useful, um, at least to have some input from subject matter expertise um, in, in whatever system that you're doing. And so we haven't gone so far to like figure out a way to uh, manually remove them, uh, or sorry, automatically remove them. Um, but I think that that would be uh, a nice way to further reduce this type of like run the engine work. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, uh, would you mind just going like, full screen uh, so that the audience can look at you <laughs> better perhaps? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, stop sharing. Okay, cool. Awesome. I think this might be our last question for this session. Um, Andrew asks to compute the scores for our data points. Is it enough for the model team to provide the data team with a trained model? that we can use for inference? Or do we need activations or other values from inside the network? Yeah, so I think there's this. Um, so what I showed here was going through this, uh, you know, training through iterations and collecting these these um, statistics through the, um, like, Really, really, if you, you know, you have a softmax layer. As long as you have the logits, you can you can calculate the the metrics. Um, analogously, you could use things like dropout, and and what you're really I think looking for is some type of way to, um, uh, I guess, ensemble a average um, model uh, performance, and and so like these models. Um, at the end of the day, they are like deterministic how like input goes to output, but really it's very dependent on like a random process of how you're training. So one way to potentially experiment is with dropout. So if you don't want to collect it during the training process, you could, you could do that um, just providing the set of weights. Um, we played around that a little bit and qualitatively, uh, it seemed like going through this training approach seemed to yield more, um, I guess informatively, like there's a reason why things are in the hard to learn region, um, but but could be worth playing out uh, playing with if, if you don't want to go through a full training. Got it. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, uh, thanks a lot for your incredible talk. Will uh, we are really glad to have you here. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.